Drawing a line in the sand, principle or expediency? Hey, everybody, it's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel of free speechers today includes Lilo Staten, healthcare reporter for NJ Spotlight News, Dustin Rassiopi, editor at Politico NJ, and Brent Johnson, politics reporter for NJ Advance Media. We're going to hear from the panel in just a bit, but we begin today with the party line, that system of preference given to favored candidates, which some studies show makes a candidate who gets it almost unbeatable. Our guest this morning fought that line before he became a part of the establishment. He's running for governor now and has joined the chorus of candidates calling uh, for the courts to help tear it down. Democrat and Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop joins us now. Mayor, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So we'll start with the line and then we'll work, work our way around to some other issues here. Uh, so a lot of people have, have uh, joined this case. There are actually two cases now. Um, are you playing an active role in either? I mean, no, but six months ago, we were very, very vocal on calling for the abolishing the line prior to all of this. And uh, I got a lot of pushback for it at the time. And uh, I think at this point, there's enough people that filed amicus briefs that the judge certainly knows that the public sentiment is it's time for it to change. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Andy Kim's case uh, is seeking an injunction. Uh, it gets a hearing tomorrow. Um, should a judge be telling a party how to run its primaries? Well, look, I, I, I think the more interesting thing about that question is not what Andy Kim is uh, or the plaintiff is saying in this case. It's that there is not one single chairman that has vocally defended the line. So since this all started, you haven't seen any of the big chair people come up and say, this is the reason the line exists, which leads you to the conclusion that they inherently know it's wrong and it's going away. So I do think that absent a judge making a decision, those people won't do it by their own choice. So I think it's important for a judge to put his finger on the scale and say, we should do it like every other state in the country. So uh, you support Murphy for Senate, but also support Kim's suit. Is that right? Yeah, it's a complicated situation. I mean, I, I didn't know Andy Kim initially, and uh, it, it's totally fair that uh, Tammy has been an early supporter of a lot of the initiatives that we did here. I felt comfortable with her knowing that I have a year of a year and a half left as mayor, and I wanted to work with somebody that I knew. Um, you know, I, I'm really not enamored with how she's run her campaign. Um, I, I, there's a lot of things that they've put forward that I don't agree with from a policy standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, I made a decision in the first couple of days, and uh, that's what I said, so I'm going to stick with it. But it doesn't mean I can't criticize a campaign, and I certainly don't agree with the process around the line and the power brokers influencing the election the way they have. I got to tell you, Mayor, that sounds to me like buyer's regret. I mean, I'm not going to call it buyer's regret. I mean, I made a decision. I got to stick with it. But... You know, look, again, I, I, I do feel that the campaign has really not made a compelling case around her candidacy. I mean, yeah. if I'm being honest and fair, um, I think that there is a lot to be, um, you know, still needed to define her as why she's seeking the seat and why she's a better candidate for it. And just saying that the maternal um, health issue uh, is the reason that she should be in the Senate isn't one that I think will move enough voters to secure that seat for her. So I think there's still a lot of runway over the next three months. And my hope is that the campaign s switches into another gear. The goal has to be to, to present a rationale for her candidacy, yeah? Yeah, I, I don't think they've done that yet. You know, when, when this started, you know, I looked at it really from who I felt comfortable with and who I knew. And maybe I should have been more cautious. Maybe I should have waited a little bit longer. But, you know, I was really thinking about kind of the Jersey City relationship. But yeah. you know, look, as the campaign has progressed, you know, there's been a lot of reasons to be concerned about that campaign, just regards to making the case, regards to the establishment. And, you know, there's a clear, clear voice from the base of the Democratic Party saying that they're just not happy 
with what's happening in Trenton and what's happening in our politics throughout New Jersey, whether it's the Oprah bill or it's uh, the line. Yeah. And I think if you don't listen to those people, eventually they will move away from the party establishment. There's a big risk for everybody on that. All right. I'm running out of time. I want to get some panel questions in here. Uh, Brent, you got yeah. a question. Yeah, well, uh, you're running for governor. And why don't you think a, a Newark mayor or a Jersey City mayor has ever been elected to that position? Ah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I think uh, I met with Paul Jordan, who ran. He was in my office. He ran in, I guess, 1980. We talked a lot about how the mayoral election impacted him. So it happened simultaneously. Brett Schellner was a Republican in a very tough year. But, you know, I think each election is their own sort of candidates and candidacy. And I think I'm going to have a very, very compelling argument. And I think if there's ever an opportunity for a big city mayor to be elected, I think it's this this election in 2025. Hmm. All right. Uh, Dustin, you had a question. Yes, uh, thanks. The you recently laid out a challenge to the other candidates for governor, basically saying that you'll run off the line if they do the same. If I'm getting that accurate, yeah. why would you running off the line be contingent on what the other candidates do? Look, at the, I, it's a fair question. I mean, from my standpoint, I'm indifferent whether I run with lines or without the lines. My plan is to support assembly candidates and county commissioners in every single county, create our own good government oriented activist team that isn't beholden to anybody, put money into it and let the chips fall where they may. Um, the system is what the system is. And uh, after this election, I'm sure I'm going to make an announcement about where I'm going to position myself with regards to lines, regardless after the primary. But, um, you know, it's an opportunity to draw the contrast with the other potential candidates, because I think for the most part, what they're saying is disingenuous when they say, hey, abolish the line only after the chairman of their county has said, let's create uniformity. And then you use the same term. So I'm going to call somebody out on that because it's not sincere. And we're going to create that contrast because that's what a campaign is about. But right after this election, you know, from my standpoint, I'm relatively indifferent. You try to create a big tent. You try to get everybody involved. If they don't want to be a part of it, it's not going to change my candidacy and what I say one bit. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, I'm running out of time here, Mayor, but I know I saw you at the State House uh, this week. You were there to testify on the Oprah bill and, and affordable yep. housing. I don't know if you were able to stick around through that marathon to get to uh, the Oprah bill, but... Well, your thoughts on it. Um, you mentioned that you're against it. What is it? What's most objectionable in it to you? Look, I, I think transparency is important for government trust. I mean, we deal with more Oprah requests in Jersey City than anybody in New Jersey. Um, it is cumbersome. We are not perfect. We've ultimately gone to court on a handful of cases yeah. that we think were unfair. But I do recognize that it's important for the government trust. And I think that what has Trenton done in the last year They've watered down ELEC with regards to campaign finance. They're watering down uh, transparency and the line conversation. It goes back to the fact that you are going to lose the grassroots, which is important to the Democratic Party. You talked uh, you did get a chance to talk about the affordable housing bill. Yeah, uh, we should say that in your city, my city, too, uh, you have a large development, almost as large as the Newport uh, development. We're going to have 30 percent affordable housing, which is, I think, kind of unprecedented. Giving, having said that, um, what is it about the affordable housing bill uh, that you support or don't support? I mean, we have a campaign platform that's detailed on my website that is more substantive than any campaign probably in the country for statewide office. We have a detailed affordable housing plan on how we're going to more than double production. There's a lot of good things in this bill. The most important thing that they could change immediately, though, is that they let cities like Jersey City and Hoboken not have an obligation. And that puts pressure on a lot of other municipalities throughout New Jersey. And I think that it's important that Jersey City is included. I think it's the right thing to do, sends the right message. I think places like Hoboken should be included with obligations and it relieves pressure on other municipalities throughout the area as well. All right. Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop, good to see you, man. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Panel, uh, panel, Lilo, Dustin, Brent, good to see you all. Uh, let's start with the party line. Uh, Brent, there's a hearing Monday on the Kim campaign's suit uh, to stop the line like now. Uh, this is an effort that appears to be gaining steam. Uh, what are the prospects uh, of it, do you think? 
this is a really tough one to gauge, but yeah, there, I mean, this obviously has been a topic that's been debated for decades in New Jersey, especially in the last 10 years. And this is, it's really hit a fever pitch. People I speak to say that they haven't seen this much discussion on it in the past. So it's very possible a judge could come in and say some changes need to be done. I don't know whether a judge will make that leap, but at the very least, this has really gotten a conversation, uh, you know, started and, and will you know, something, it seems, seems like something is going to change from here. I can't just imagine everybody just dropping this and moving on. Yeah, Dustin, this is as close uh, as, as we've ever been to a potential change uh, to this system. We just saw the Essex County chair come out for reforms of some sort. Is, is the end nigh for the line? Um, I agree with Brent that it's very difficult to gauge. I disagree with Brent that 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 this may see some action. I can definitely see a scenario where um, if they get a favorable ruling that the county chairs will just do nothing about this because- That's a good point, yeah. Um, as, uh, yeah, I mean, as we heard before, nobody has really come out in strong defense of the line who, has, who oversees the line. So therefore, why would they change it? And there's no incentive for them to change it. So you have the party base that's mad I don't know if that's as much of a motivating factor for people um, as as some might think. Yeah, the party base has been mad before. So uh, let's talk right. about this Oprah bill. Uh, started the week on a fast track and by Thursday had gotten derailed. Uh, we as journalists were in the odd place of covering something that directly affected our work. So that was a little weird. But uh, the reality is Lilo... You can't do your job effectively if you can't get access to the info covered by Oprah. Yeah, I mean, that is true. And it does matter for journalists. I mean, and it matters. I was thinking about this earlier. I haven't covered it. I'm lucky that our colleague Colleen O'Day has been doing such a good job with that. Um, but, you know, it really... It, it shouldn't be about us. Yes. I mean, we are a critical consumer of Oprah yeah. information, but, um, you know, I keep coming back to, you know, if you're paying for something, um, you should really be able to know where that money is going. And we have this argument with the state all the time. I mean, you know, even now, clearly Oprah needs some reform because there are people who are abusing it. Um, I would say, you know, probably in the corporate space, mostly, um, you know, I think the sense that people are harassing their, their public officials by filing too many Oprah requests is sort of silly. Um, but, you know, yes, there are people making money off Oprah and maybe that needs to, that clearly needs to be addressed. But, you know, there's also the problem that the law as it is now is grossly abused all the time. And journalists and other, you know, requesters don't have the time, space, money, capacity to challenge every time we get, you know, jerked around on Oprah. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is nine times out of 10, you're jerked around. I mean, right. Am I wrong? Yeah, totally. I mean, almost everything comes back with a small part portion of what you asked for. Usually long after the deadline, it has been like this in past administrations. This administration is worse, I would argue, but you know, they're all very nice, but it's rare. I would argue the governor's office has someone I've met who's fabulous, but, you know, it is rare that you find Oprah information easily. And, yeah. you know, the law, it's not working as it is. So maybe it's time for change, but it sounds like the one they created, the bill that's created was just a mess. Yeah. Uh, Dustin, you had some big stories over the last few years. Can you talk a little bit about how the documents you got through Oprah request help break news and, and make change? Well, one example that comes to mind that would change under the current version of the reform bill was, is the, was to exempt metadata that, that shows like what the, what the document's history is. So like, if you open up a word document, you can see when it was created, when it was modified, right. um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how, I learned some years ago that um, that an agency had ha created job descriptions for people after they had hired them, which was, you know, an egregious abuse of um, 
of power yeah. and patronage. Um, so it's it's basic stuff like that. And I got it. I had to put up a little fight, but didn't have to sue anybody. But as, as Lilo said, so often you're fighting for some basic documents like this. We They have them on file. It's part of the job. They should be able to just turn these things over. But so often we have to fight um, and file complaints or go to court. And by the time that you actually get these things that are usually readily available, it's kind of too late. So you can't yeah. you know, break that news or provide, illuminate on things that the public should know about fairly yeah. quickly. So yeah. that's just one example that comes to my mind that, was, that and, just doesn't seem to make sorry, sense. Sorry, I would just argue too that it ends up becoming a waste of everybody's time and often because I have had many Oprah requests that were delayed so long that by the time I got the information, a, it wasn't newsworthy, and B, I was in a position, you know, it was then budget season or something, you know, right. I, there was no way I could do the story. And, you know, then I feel badly about wasting their time. Well, you know, if we had just agreed, you know, responded in what the law requires, we wouldn't be having this, you know, this issue. But yeah, yeah. Brent, you and, and Ted Sherman and Sue Livio uh, over at NJ Advanced Media have done some great work over the past few years as well. Um, I think a lot of folks reading and, and watching the news may not know the big difference an Oprah request makes between the public learning about deaths at nursing homes and not, right? Well, it's funny because you have a lot of public sentiment that is so uh, anti-government lately, and, and you'd think that they would want, hey, let, you know, let's open it up, let's let's bring some sun, sunshine in. But you know, a lot of you know a lot of people don't pay that granular attention to, to these kind of things. So it's important that when we put in stories that uh, the things were obtained through a public records request or we've learned something. You know, this is what makes our job more than stenographers, that we're not just there repeating what's being told to us. This is us digging deeper. And curbing that is uh, will be a major loss, not just to journalism, but to readers who need to learn things. Yeah. Uh, that takes us to the other big story of the week, this report about how the state handled the COVID crisis. Uh, 900 pages, uh, lots of stories to tell. Lilo, I imagine you've already started on that. Uh, what jumped out at you from this report? Uh, many things, but particularly the lack of planning. Um, the fact, or I should say, the fact that there was a plan that people didn't know about and that wasn't um, hadn't been used, hadn't been drilled on, um, you know, that's really concerning. And, and I have to say, I keep coming back to those press conferences that we all attended at which the governor repeatedly said, we are building this plane while we're flying it. And, you know, part of me thinks, and, and to be clear, the report also found that the state did relatively well. And I think there are plenty of, yes, I will get hate mail, but there are plenty of independent metrics that do suggest New Jersey's response was was robust, it was bold, it saved lives without doubt. However, it could have been better. A lot of things worked well just sort of because people tried hard and did the right thing. And, yeah. you know, as much as I want to believe that will always happen, you can't count on that. Dustin, uh, 33,000 dead uh, that's higher than the population of, of almost like 400 towns um, in New Jersey. Millions lost, small business still not back, learning loss. Is this not a scandal? Mm. <laughs> what a loaded question to ask me, David. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All right, how about this? There was... Why isn't this a scandal? <laughs> <laughs> well, it ha everything that you, almost everything that you just pointed out, was a scandal. You can argue whether it was big enough, like the veterans' home situation. Right. I think the governor, relative to his counterparts in other areas of the state, namely Andrew Cuomo, got off relatively easy in terms of the scrutiny um, writ large. I mean, he got a lot of scrutiny here in New Jersey, but I think that that was a scandal, and it, and it was a scandal sometimes drummed up but sometimes legitimate about um, – the school closures and the business closures, I think he faced some serious um, criticism for that. And I, he's also, in hindsight, acknowledged some of that criticism is was valid. Um, but at the end of the day, Murphy, when his obituary is written, will probably get favorable treatment 
in retrospect for the way that he handled it for all of the reasons that Leo just laid out. Good points. Uh, I have to get to some politics here. Brent, Middlesex County Convention, show of hands. Then the chairman goes out to the back room and makes the final decision on his own. No press allowed. I mean, what kind of democracy, small d or uppercase d, is that? Yeah, I mean, this this whole race has drawn a lot of attention to, especially especially this county convention format with the, with the party line, things that none of me and my colleagues would have ended up going to in the past. Suddenly, you know, I, I'm at all these conventions and trying to figure out what's going on. You know, the argument people will say, well, this is the system we have and these are the rules we've had for a long time. And now people are coming out and saying, well, that's BS. This shouldn't be the system we have. Uh, you know, not everyone agrees with that. But but yeah, there's there's a lot of things that we haven't really thought about in the past that we're now looking at now because of this very heated, unexpectedly close U.S. Senate primary. This race is kind of like showing the world like, hey, we're New Jersey. This is our politics. <laughs> yeah, right. That's how a lot of people are saying. I would just argue it's sort of. I have the same reaction to some of this as I do to the fact that, you know, when during the Oprah session votes, they were, so, you know, they subcommittee members, right? And I think it's something that as journalists, we see so frequently that sometimes I guess we're just, I, I personally feel like I'm just kind of immune to, to getting yeah. worked up about it. But in reality, if you're the public looking in, what do you mean? You can take someone off a committee and put someone else in for the day just to literally gain a vote. I mean, yeah, you can. And it happens all the time. I mean, this is the kind of thing that like, I feel like if, if people had the time and energy to sit there and watch the C-SPAN version of New Jersey government, you know, they would be kind of appalled sometimes. And I'm, I'm, you know, not saying evil is happening. It's just, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of kind of moments that make you cringe. C-SPAN New Jersey, that would be one hell of a television <laughs> program. <laughs> not a bad idea. All right. Sponsored by our, NJ Spotlight News, I'm sure. Time for our only in Jersey moments, headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Uh, Dustin, you got one? Uh, yeah, going back to the COVID report that the governor commissioned, um, you know, we've been very critical of the governor in the past um, and continue to be, but got to give credit where it's due. New Jersey, as far as we know, is the only state to have undertaken you know, this type of postmortem, as he calls it. Yeah. And the federal government hasn't done that. And that is kind of a sad indictment of where we are because as we as we know and as lilo pointed out we had this pandemic plan from 2015 or so and if we don't try to learn from the lessons of this one we're not going to be prepared for the next one and there will be a next one so i think new jersey can be an example to other states to prepare for the next uh catastrophe all right justin's in a good mood today uh brent <laughs> you got one for us well i'm one of my uh passions is that I'm a real big Oscar and Oscar history junkie. And uh, it was in interesting to see Oppenheimer, which was partially filmed in New Jersey and partially set in New Jersey and Princeton, uh, one best picture to show the world that New Jersey is the universe and the rest of you just don't understand. <laughs> All roads lead to and through New Jersey. Uh, mine, comes, mine comes from Trenton. Let's put a period on Sunshine Week. Uh, Monday's marathon Senate committee meeting on Oprah ran almost eight hours, never mind that an assembly committee was hearing the testimony on the, on the same topic at the same time, so you had to pick which one to cover, which, okay, fine. But after hanging in there for, let's call it seven hours, usually the chair will stick around for what we call a gaggle, but this week Chairman Senator Paul Sarlo ran away from the press, which is bad enough, if not unprecedented, but Assembly Committee Chairman Joe Danielson added insult to insult when after the meeting, rather than answering questions about the bill from reporters, berated the press for not covering the bill just the way he liked it, capping it off by calling us fake news. We wanted to bring him on the air uh, to speak his piece, but his office told us now he's not talking to reporters. That emphasis was mine. Uh, no need to file an Oprah request to find out what the assemblyman really thinks. Thanks for letting us know. And that's Roundtable for this week. Lilo, Brent, Dustin, good to see you all. Thanks also to Mayor Fulop 
for joining us. You can follow the show on X at Roundtable NJ and find more stuff, including web extras and full episodes when you scan the QR code on your screen. I'm David Cruz. For all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.